Okay. So uh, everyone, thank you so much for joining. This is a big team effort. We have volunteers from RCC. We have volunteer educators, and we have all of our wonderful clinic coordinators at every center helping to, to communicate and make sure that everyone at your center is aware and able to join these sessions. So this is Dr. Frank Ascoli. He's a, a retired medical physicist after a long productive career and currently affiliated with US Oncology. And he, today he's gonna to talk about the importance of calibration audits and intercomparisons. Thank you, Ben. And welcome to everyone listening in on this important lecture about peer review. I can't emphasize enough how important peer review is in our field of radiation therapy, not only for the doctors who certainly do their share of peer review through chart rounds and new patient rounds, and maybe even contour rounds, but for physicists who are charged with keeping the clinic safe and accurate. Peer review cannot be overstressed how important it is to prevent serious errors from happening. And those type of errors can affect many, many patients over many, many treatments. Let's start with a mistake. You're probably familiar with the IAEA's ROSIS ROSIS reporting scheme, which is an error collection program on an international level to look at errors, analyze them, find out what went wrong in the delivery of radiation to patients, and try to find some way to prevent them from happening again. So I picked out a few of these reported errors uh, from the IAEA that highlight the importance of peer review and what type of peer review we should be doing as physicists working in a busy clinic. Sometimes we don't have the benefit of having many physicists to talk to and to have different people calibrate the machines, different instruments, different ways. Many times we're found where the only physicist in a very busy center. And that should always raise a warning flag that if you're the only physicist at a very busy center, how do you know what you're doing is correct? So the first error here was dosimetry calibration report used incorrectly. The standard for, for uh, instrument calibration is cobalt 60. And it's done in a standard calibration laboratory. There are many throughout the country and the world. The calibration certificate was in terms of dose to water. This is very much the, the current way of doing things. Your instrument is calibrated in terms of centigrade delivered to water. However, the physicists, for some unknown reason, interpreted the result as specifying dose in air. And as you can imagine, because of the conversion factors from air to water, the resulting error overdosed patients by 11% for at least a whole year. The initiating event was an incorrect use of a calibration certificate. And then the IAEA also looks at contributing factors. They determined that there was insufficient education, insufficient training or expertise. The physicists did not seem to understand the certificate. And there was no independent beam calibration by another physicist, or I might even add by an outside agency, which could have picked this up. This is what my calibration report looks like. And this is from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin, US. It's cobalt-60 absorbed dose to water. I've outlined in red the important number, 5.336 times 10 to the seventh grays per coulomb. That is my NDW. That is the calibration factor for 
getting me from coulombs, which is measured by my electrometer and every electrometer in use today is going to be measuring coulombs. How do you get from coulombs to dosing water? You use this NDW. It's a very, very important factor. In the US, we have to have our instruments calibrated every two years. And in addition, we should be showing a yearly intercomparison between other instruments that we use in the clinic. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. Now, also important, highlighted in blue, many mistakes are made because the instrument calibration is referenced to the wrong temperature and pressure. In the bottom of the report there, it says very clearly 22 degrees C and 101.325 kilopascals, which is 760 millimeters of mercury. That's the number that I like to use. So all the instruments are calibrated to nominal standard temperature and pressure. Very important number. Every two years, your instrument should be calibrated. So a Rankin is of course not equal to a RAD. If the result is interpreted as an air exposure, it's going to be off by about 11%. So what was missing was the conversion from air to water, or it was just really misinterpreted as a dose in air as opposed to a dose in water, resulting in about an 11% after you apply all the other factors, an 11% overdose to all of the patients treated at that clinic. Here's another error. This is more of a mechanical error. Incorrect use of a plain parallel chamber. A new physicist at a hospital used a plain parallel chamber to calibrate several electron beams. This is a new physicist. A label on the chamber was placed by the previous physicist indicated which side of the chamber to expose to the incident radiation. The physicist had used the chamber correctly. The labeling was incorrect and it was never changed. The new physicist came in, saw the label, which was incorrect, assumed it to be correct. And as you can see, the following errors in dose were recorded until the error was caught. This is a mechanical error in a transition from one physicist to another and something as simple as an incorrect label could cause severe overdose and even some underdose. This is what a plain parallel chamber looks like. It has the top and it has a bottom. These are the components of a plain parallel chamber. In the TG51 protocol, which I use, it's recommended for electron beams of lower energy. And we can also use it for a variety of other reasons too. But you can see from the cross-sectional diagram that the uh, chamber clearly has a top and a bottom and must be used in the correct position, especially with electrons, because the electron has a depth dose that falls off so quickly that it could make a big difference with the lower energy beams that we saw. In the analysis of this event, it was very interesting that mailed TLDs, mailed uh, dosimetry independent second check peer-reviewed dosimeters from an independent laboratory were used routinely by the institution. So this is a good thing. The TLDs are used routinely, usually yearly, sometimes even semi-annually, if you want to be extra, extra careful, twice a year. But the norm is usually once a year. An independent lab will send TLDs for cross calibration. And when the TLDs were reviewed by the dosimetry laboratory, that's when the error became obvious. And luckily, the incorrect outputs 
hadn't been used for very long and it affected only a few patients and not say a whole year's worth of patients. The initiating event was the incorrect calibration, incorrect use of a parallel plate chamber. But showing the importance of how mailed service, mailed in TLD, or there's another type called OSL, optically stimulated luminescent. Basically, they do the same thing. These independent dosimeters are sent for irradiation by the uh, institution and are returned quite quickly, usually within a week or two, with the result. And the physicist there can then check to see if their calibrations are correct within a tolerance level. It, this service has been instrumental in preventing major errors from happening. Again, showing the importance of peer review in what we do. The contributing factors that the IAEA reviewed, basically incorrect labeling, and the physicist, the replacement physicist or the new physicist, used a chamber that was unfamiliar to him or her did not verify the proper technique. So one could even imagine that a physicist with more experience would have looked at the chamber and said, that's obviously wrong. I know the front of the chamber from the back of the chamber and used it correctly, but that doesn't always happen. Sometimes the replacement physicist may be very young and experienced and just takes it at face value that the instrument was used in the correct orientation. Miscommunication and inexperience on the part of the new physicist. Of course, once the situation was corrected, then the doses were, were correct, but it would not have been found had it not been for the peer review of the calibration of the uh, dosimetry laboratory. A third error that can be quite common throughout the world because of the different heights, geographical heights that we operate at. Some of us work at sea level, some of us work at some very high altitudes and serious, serious errors have happened because of wrong barometric pressure readings. Here's a situation that the physicist relied on the local airport. Many times physicists will call the airport for a barometric pressure to correct their a vented ionization chamber. This is a dangerous, uh, dangerous thing to do unless the physicist clearly understands how the airport is reporting barometric pressure. Now, the physicist happened to be at a thousand meters in, in, in height. The clinic was located a thousand meters above sea level because the pressure is going to be lower there. However, the airport reports corrected uh, pressure corrected to sea level because pilots need to know both the elevation above sea level, but they also need to know what the elevation is, where they plan on landing the aircraft. The, the, and pilots are trained to know what the pressure is that they're receiving. But a physicist calling an airport doesn't know, necessarily know where that pressure is being reported. Is it being reported at the altitude of the airport or is it being reported relative to sea level? In this particular situation at 1,000 meters, it resulted in a 13% overdose to patients. And the error affected the calibration of all machines, all patients, every treatment the use of incorrect pressure to correct for atmospheric pressure resulted in a improper calibration, a very, very serious 13% error. Why did this happen? The institution did not have its own barometer, so it relied on the airport. Here's a little drawing that shows the problem. The airport is at field elevation, what the pilots call QFE. The QFE 
is the pressure that you want. You want the pressure at the altitude of your clinic. However, the airport many times gives the pilots QHN, which stands for nautical height, and the pilots adjust their instrumentation accordingly. Big, big difference depending upon how high above sea level you are. The equation well known to physicists includes a temperature and pressure calibration. And right in here, here, this P tor is where we put in our pressure for the elevation that we are located at. The calibration laboratory adjusts it to 760 millimeters of mercury. We put in our pressure here, which adjusts the reading for the pressure taken at the time of our readings. Of course, we also have to correct for temperature because temperature will change the amount of air molecules within the chamber, as will pressure. So we have to standardize the number of air molecules within the chamber to get the correct reading. There are spreadsheets that do this, 101.325 kilopascals is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. It doesn't matter which system you use as long as you have the correct pressure at the altitude of your clinic. And a final error that we can look at, again, showing the importance of peer review. Three radiation oncologists and two physicists worked at three different hospitals. And each person worked at at least two or sometimes three of the hospitals. There were two sets of calibration equipment, ionization chambers and electrometers, usually assigned to a particular hospital. The two sets of equipment were never intercompared, although they were used by both physicists. For some reason, an outside physicist was brought in for a review, not, not uncommon. Many times physicists are contracted to go in and do an outside review of, an, of a clinic. Sometimes there are certification, the certification of bodies like the American College of Radiology, which send a physicist on site to look at records and review the physics practice in each center. So an independent physicist found a discrepancy of 15% between measurements made with the two sets of equipment. Each, don't forget, each set of equipment was assigned to a, a clinic. So they were never mixed. They were never, they were never, they were never uh, sent from one clinic to the other just to see if the results were the same. They were never intercompared. Interestingly, after discussion with the physicist and the radiation doctor, physician actually said that he had noticed the difference in clinical results between the two hospitals. And he corrected for that by prescribing 70 gray instead of 60 gray. So the doctor even noticed that there was a difference in tumor response because of that miscalibration from one center to the other and the doctor compensated by increasing the dose in one center and decreasing the dose in the other center. Now this, I mean, this may work good for the doctor that the doctor realized there was a difference in clinical response, but that's not how we do things. We have to have accurate calibration and accurate reporting of radiation so that all physicians, all physicists, all clinical people have the same baseline for dose. 70 gray at institution one should be 70 gray at institution two. And the only way to assure that is by peer review, into comparison, independent auditing of your calibrations. An invalid calibration factor was used. That was the initiating event. The contributing factor, factors, lack of 
ineffective and lack of ineffective procedures. Different sets of equipment, which were different in calibration, but without any intercomparison, nobody knew that those systems were different. And of course, communication, communication, always a problem. How do you get essential information down the chain from one group to another? So this resulted in the doctor actually using a clinical prescription fudge factor, calibration factor, to make up for what the doctor was seeing as a change in tumor response between the different centers. As you know, we use a variety of chambers in our practice. These are just some of the ones we use. Chambers, thimble chambers, scanning chambers, parallel plate chambers, even diode dosimeters are used for certain measurements. In my center, I do not have a large group of physicists. Many times I practice alone. It presents unique problems because who is checking me? Well, of course I have the TLDs that are sent in semi-annually to make sure that my machines are calibrated correctly. That is so reassuring when you get that report back saying, yes, your beams are calibrated correctly. I can't emphasize how important that yearly or semi-annual validation of your output is by an outside agency. <clears throat> in, my, in my center, I have several chambers. You can see a plain parallel plate chamber up here. I have two electrometers and I have two different thimble chambers. The one with the blue cable is my standard chamber. And the one that's inside this white Dell ring cap is what I call my transit chamber that I would use in case of an emergency or as a double check against my standard chamber if I had reason to think I used it incorrectly or there was something wrong with it. I made up a phantom that you see here made up of of polystyrene, and these are the standard thicknesses that I use. No reason to use these thicknesses. These just happen to be the blocks of plastic that I have available. So this one is 24.2 millimeters. The Holt chamber is embedded in plastic. I put that here. I have a piece of plastic 9.86 millimeters with a hole drilled in that accepts both of these chambers. And then I have two blocks of plastic behind it just to provide backscatter. I set 100 SSD with a 10 by 10 field and I use six MV X-ray 100 MU with negative 300 volt bias. And I irradiate the whole block, and I will have the whole chamber here, the parallel plate chamber here, and I will substitute my different chambers in this hole for different readings. I will also substitute my electrometers to compare their readings. So this is my setup for intercomparison, and I do this at least once a year. Now the chamber goes out for calibration every two years, but once a year, I do these intercomparisons just for peace of mind to make sure that I know what the factors are on these chambers. And it's also a way to tell if anything has changed. Here's a spreadsheet that I use and it shows you the different readings. The standard chamber with the standard electrometer gives me readings in, in 10 to the minus eight coulombs. So this column here shows the average. And since this is my standard, and this is the number NDW that I got from my calibration lab, I normalize that value to 1.000. That becomes my standard. Now to that, I compare everything else. So I substitute the different electrometer with the standard chamber. 
And I find out that one electrometer is 0.7% different from the other. I can use that factor if I use the alternate electrometer. If I wanna use my transit chamber with the standard electrometer, the difference is 17%. So I correct my NDW to show that. And if I wanna use the whole chamber with the standard electrometer, it's very, very different. Look at the magnitude of difference in reading. So this becomes my new NDW if I decide to use the whole chamber. So it's important to have a standard that you send out routinely, and it's important to intercompare often, especially if you're the only physicist at that center. You need to have those intercomparisons so you know your chambers are correct. And like one of the questions said, you know, what would you do if you found that your output was off by 5%? Well, first thing you'd want to do is besides checking your setup, of course, is maybe there's something wrong with that chamber. Try a different chamber and see if you get the same result. You can't do that unless you've had intercomparisons done. Now, the American Association of Physicists and Medicine, the AAPM, has a task group report. <clears throat> the most recent one is TG51, task group 51. And that's the protocol that we use in the US. The IAEA has protocols, TRS 398-2000. So different protocols that give you the same result, the correct calibration of the beam in centigrade to water. This is a setup that I use in the States for TG51. I have a waterproof chamber. It's submerged in water up to a standard depth. We, we use 10 centimeters and a standard field size at a standard distance. So we're taking that thimble chamber measuring it in water at a standard depth, and then using the calibration factor NDW, which gets us from, from coulombs to centigrade to actually get the output of that beam in water. That is the absolute dose calibration of that machine. It's probably the most important thing that we as physicists do in a clinic is to make sure that the accuracy of the dose is correct and standardized to a calibration laboratory. If an engineer comes in and changes certain key components of the machine, it's so important to recheck the calibration of the machine and be sure that the output, the dose, per monitor unit is consistent and hasn't changed. The engineers where I practice in the States, they never adjust the output of the machine. That's my job. It is the job of the physicist to adjust the output of the linear accelerator. The engineers can change components and can repair the machine, but it is up to me, the physicist, to make sure that when the doctor prescribes 70 gray, in fact, the patient is getting 70 gray and not anything significantly different. So it is the job of the physicist to ensure accuracy and safety. We have a wonderful group in the, in the States that also provides into comparisons worldwide. It used to be called the Radiological Physics Center, the RPC. It's located at the uh, MD Anderson, as you can see here, it's located at the MD Anderson Tumor Institute in Houston, Texas. And this is a wonderful group of physicists. A lot of them are students in their graduate program at MD Anderson. And they work under the direction of Dr. Followell, who is in charge of the laboratory. And they send out TLD or OSL to many, many centers throughout the whole world to check the calibration 
of their beams. This is a paid service and I don't honestly know how much it costs, but here's the website that you can go to and get information on TLD and OSL intercomparisons. I'm gonna show you a little bit more about that, how it looks. But for now, take this address down if you're interested and see what they can do to help you with your peer review to make sure that your doses are correct. They put a big disclaimer in here. This information should be used only as a check of machine operation. It is not as calibration. It is not an alternative to calibration by a qualified physicist, but it gives you the reassurance that you've done it correctly. Outside of the US, here's the website for the IAEA. They do the same thing. They will send you TLDs or OSLs for your intercomparisons. You can take this website down and contact them about having intercomparisons done. And it's a, it's a terrific service. It has prevented many, many serious errors from happening and keeps, keeps what we do accurate and safe. The TLD or the OSL that I get from IROC looks like this. They come in cubes and you can see the dosimeters are embedded in plastic. Here's what a dosimeter looks like. This one happens to be an optically stimulated luminescent dosimeter, not TLD, that does the same thing. And these are the blocks that they give you to do the irradiation in. Here is a very typical setup. Put it on a platform, set up the block here. The TLD is embedded in the block. And what the IROC says to do is deliver 100 centigrade to this block with a 10 by 10 field, 100 SSD. So they give you the distance, the field size, they tell you the dose to deliver, and they tell you at what depth. They want it at D max. So the maximum depth dose is where you calculate this for. So using your table and your adjusted output, your what you think is the correct output of that machine, you give 100 centigrade at 100 SSD, 10 by 10 field, D max. And they will tell you in a week or two exactly how much dose you gave to that. And that is your reassurance that you've calibrated the machine correctly. TLD is in the form of powder on the left. Sometimes it comes like this, but the optically stimulated luminescent dosimeters are right here. They're very tiny. They're on the right, right here. They both give you the same thing. The laboratory will make the following adjustments. You don't even have to worry about this. The laboratory does this, but just as a point of information, they take the raw signal that they get from the reading. So they read it in a special reader. This one reads it by laser. This one reads it by heat. TLD is read by heating up the material and looking at how much light is emitted because it stores the radiation as a high electron quantum level, which is released by heat. So the amount of light that this gives off is proportional to the dose that it received. Over here, it's heated up by a laser. The amount of light that it gives off is proportional to the amount of X-ray or electrons that were incident on it. The raw reading is corrected by a sensitivity factor for that particular dosimeter. Every dosimeter is a little different. So there's a sensitivity correction there. Here's the calibration factor, the NDW that they use to get from the reading in, 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 in light to a reading of dose in water. So the amount of light that's given off is converted to a dose in water using this NDW. And then they apply three other important factors. 
There is a beam quality dependence. So whether you're using 6X or 10X or 15X, whether you're using different electrons, there's always an energy calibration factor that has to be applied. Also with these dosimeters, there is a small nonlinearity. The amount of light given off at 100 centigrades may not be exactly proportional to the amount of light given at 300 centigrade. So there's a non-linearity to the amount of light given off by dose. So they correct for that. See, they, they, they have figured out all the correction factors to put in. This system is well-developed. And then the final correction factor is the fading correction factor because over time, the higher energy states begin to decay down. So if you irradiate your dosimeters, say at the beginning of the month, but then you decide for some reason not to mail them until the end of the month, well, there's already been a decay in the amount of light given off by these dosimeters. But since you note the time of the irradiation, the laboratory will correct for the fading time. So this, this formula is well thought out and takes into account all of the different variations. You can, you can get a very accurate reading from these laboratories. Hey, Frank, maybe we yes. can go back, back to the slide you were just on and, and yes. pause here. I think we have some good questions from the audience. Oh, sure. Okay. Yes. So one of the questions is, is ionization chamber does an ionization chamber have a specified lifetime? Does it expire? Okay. I mean, I'm sorry. There's a lot of uh, background noise, Ben. Can we mute uh, Abdul? Okay, great. Okay. So the question is, uh, does an ionization chamber have a lifetime, a shelf life? In my experience, most of the chambers that I use Farmer chambers, thimble chambers, plain parallel chambers have never changed calibration over the over the lifetime. They have I have used them for for decades, and I've never seen a change. Very very slight, slight slight change, less than 0.2, 0.3% every time I send it out for calibration. So a high quality air ionization chamber will not deteriorate over time. However, there are different dosimeters. Diodes dosimeters do have a change over time. The diode dosimeter notoriously gets less sensitive the more radiation it's given. So a diode, yes, definitely, you will see a change in calibration over time. MOSFETs, another type of semiconductor radiation device, has a shelf life. It shows a less sensitive reading over time. So the chemical dosimeters do show a change over time, but the air ionization chambers, I have personally not witnessed a change in sensitivity. I would be very concerned if a chamber came back with a significantly different calibration factor. And, and by that, I mean probably 1%. If a chamber came back 1% different from what it was two years ago, I need to think that maybe something changed in that chamber. Maybe I banged it. Maybe I, maybe somehow some water got inside of it. Maybe when I was unscrewing the protective cap, I may have loosened the connection a little bit. So they will change if mechanically you've done something to change them. But if they're carefully taken care of, and intercompared regularly, you won't see a change. Great, good answer. And Mieda, I hope that helps answer your question. The next question is, is from Mohammed. Is it better to get the measurement of the output in electrical units and then manually convert it to dose using the calibration and correction factors or inputting these factors in the electrometer to get radiologic measurements? Well, I, I'm familiar with the first way because that's what I do. And the second way would work as long as you have confidence in what you're doing because you're not changing any of the 
you're not changing any of the conditions of the radiation and you've just decided to include it in the electrometer, that's fine as long as you know you're doing it correctly. So either way is fine. I happen to prefer the first way. I have a spreadsheet and I always measure in coulombs and I convert that electrical reading. But if you have an electrometer that will do that for you, and as long as you're convinced that it hasn't changed, then that way would also be satisfactory. But the point is that you have to always be reviewing this and double checking it with either into comparisons with systems within your own clinic, or even if you have a colleague at another center, you can have an intercomparison get together and the colleagues can get together and have one evening where they calibrate all their instruments together and do an intercomparison that way. You could call it a calibration party and maybe have some snacks <laughs> and drinks, <laughs> but you could do it that way too by having your colleagues bring instruments over and everybody try to calibrate the same machine at the same time and see if they come up with the same number. But the point is that you have to have some type of oversight peer review into comparison, but either way works. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And there was another question about how do we do the calibration and Tia posted a response that there's a really good resource for TLDs and OSLDs called the task group 191. Mm -hmm. and and so that link is posted. So I, I think that's a good resource. Do you agree, Frank? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the last question is, is the, the TLD that you were showing used for all energies or just some energies? And uh, Tia responded that the TLD can be used for all energies, but they do need to be calibrated. Yes. And the slide that I have up there shows that, that there is a, a beam quality dependence factor right here, KQ, which corrects it for the, for the different energies. Afif, did you have a question? Do you have a question, Afif? Oh. Okay, I think no question. Let's continue the session okay. now. Yes. Great. The laboratory that does the TLD and OSL will even give you a plotted history. And you can tell from this, that it's basically been within 2%, but there's one up here at 3%, still not a reason for concern unless you want to investigate it a little bit more and find out why. The laboratory that I use at MD Anderson in Texas says that the result is accurate and within 5%. So any reading, anything within 5%, they consider that to be a pass. 5% is a little too much for me. I start to get a little nervous at what you see here, 3%. And maybe I want to investigate that a little bit more because the TLDs tend, do tend to be very, very accurate. But because of all of their uncertainty factors they've, they've analyzed, they tell you that you can consider a pass within 5%. The IROC, Imaging and Radiation Oncology Corps, formerly the Radiological Physics Center, RPC at, at MD Anderson, published this a little while ago. It's the results of 16,000 TLD measurements and over 4,000 OSL measurements. And you can see that most institutions do very well in the middle here between say 0.97 and 1.03. Most institutions do very, very well. However, these are the ones you worry about, these outliers, because they're doing something wrong. Now, it may have been a mistake. Maybe they irradiated with the wrong energy. I don't know. Or it may be a systematic error that they're doing and they don't know it. But these are the ones that are very worrisome. These are the ones where patients will be harmed if the dose is off by that much, these outliers here. Now the IROC is very good about follow-up. 
if they find a dosimeter that exceeds 5% here or here, they will give you a telephone call immediately and tell you that your results are off by over 5%. Do you want to check and try again? So they will follow up with a phone call if your results are over 5% off. And if they're consistently over 5% off, let's say you say, no, I'm sure, and you do another batch and it comes out the same way, they will even send a physicist to your center and check the calibration of your machine. And that happened to me once, a long, long time ago, many, many years ago, when I had to commission one of the first electron linear accelerators. I go back over 48 years. So one of the first electron accelerators, many, many years ago, I had to commission it and I did not calibrate it correctly. Luckily, we, don't treat, we didn't treat any patients until I got the report back from the RPC, but they reported a 7% error, which I thought was, was, was correct. I, I said, no, th this is how I calibrate it. They sent the physicist out with equipment to help me calibrate the machine. So that's how seriously they take it. So there's very, very good follow-up with these, with these, with these mailed in dosimetry systems, at least my experience with MD Anderson has been very, very good. They have a, they have physicists that they can send on site to help you do the calibration. So here's my last slide. In conclusion, serious errors can happen and continue to happen when there is no peer review. Always follow the accepted protocols. Do not deviate from the accepted protocols. Be especially aware of your altitude barometric pressure corrections. You should have something to compare your thermometer to, and you should have something to be sure that your barometer is correct. Even if it means calling another physicist at another center and say, can you just check my barometric pressure and make sure I got it right? Do not call the airport unless you are absolutely sure of the pressure that they're giving you. Definitely perform inter-facility or in-house calibration procedures to make sure that you intercompare and use the services of the IAEA or IROC to yearly audit the output of all energies on all machines to make sure that you are doing your output calibrations correctly. So thank you very much. And I will stay on if Tia or Ben want to field any more questions, I would be happy to answer them for you. But thank you very much and stay well and the best of wishes to all of you out there. Thank you so much, Frank. That was a very enjoyable session. At this time, if there are any questions, please feel free to turn off your microphone and you can ask them or you can type them in the chat box. I did have one question. So on the last mm -hmm. slide, you said to on how frequently to do these comparisons. Mm -hmm. So just to make sure I have this straight, how how often should you intercompare your, your primary standard with your backup instrumentation? I do that yearly because the primary goes out every two years. So once a year, I run an intercomparison of all my instruments. Okay. So I left the web address up for the IAEA, and then I'll go back a few slides, or one slide here, and here's the web address for MD Anderson. Very good. Well, you've inspired me to make sure that wherever practice I go, that, <laughs> that we're doing this. Let's see, we have one question. What are the mistakes in completing ionization chamber? Mida, maybe you can put your microphone on to ask a question. Hello, Doctor. Hello. What are the errors in using an ionization chamber? Yes. Yes. What type of errors can you make in the use of an ionization chamber? Is what you're asking? I, yes, I think that's what she means. Okay. Well, that's, that's a, that could be a very long answer, 
there are many errors that you can make in the use of an ionization chamber. And it starts with the correct temperature and pressure. Are you using the correct temperature and pressure to correct your reading? Because the chambers that we use, all of them, to my knowledge, communicate with the outside air, with the air in the room. And the readings that you get will vary from day to day, sometimes up to 2% depending upon temperature pressure. So you must correct your reading with temperature and pressure. Let's see, no, right, oh, yeah, right here. You have to correct your chamber reading with temperature and pressure correction. The electrometer itself, you want to make sure that the electrometer has been calibrated and that you're using it on the correct scale usually 10 to the minus eight or 10 to the minus nine coulombs. The chamber geometry is so important. Are you, are you measuring in water and are you measuring with the correct field size, the correct distance and the correct depth? So those are all important setups parameters that you need to use. The right chamber, the right depth, the right SSD, the right field size, the number of MU, there has to be a consistency there. And I find in my practice that I use a Excel spreadsheet where I have all the factors listed and I put my numbers into that spreadsheet and that gives me my reading in uh, centigrade per MU. But those are just a few of the very important things to look at when you do a chamber calibration. Does that help answer the question? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great. Well, we're at the hour. So thank you everyone so much for taking the time to join today. We hope that this helps your centers. We look forward to the next steps. Thank you so much for your completion of the homework assignments and always feel free to reach out to us. Oh, yes. Yes, Abdo, do you have a question? Hello, Dr. Or... Ben. Say, Hello, yes. Doctor. I have Hi. a question, please. Yes. Uh, what are the preferred that we can use? Uh, what are the preferred uh, ionization chambers that you can use? Small oh, okay. size. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yes. Yes. Do you see? This is the one that I use. You yeah. heard me? Yes, I can. What are the preferred ionization chambers? Yeah. Okay. So for TG51, which is the US protocol, I use a farmer chamber. It's called a farmer chamber, and yeah. it's, made, it's made by PTW. And this is it right here. It's a waterproof chamber made by PTW. Can you see it on the screen? Can you see it? The one that I'm pointing to right here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is the one that I use yeah. for my Thank absolute you. calibration. PTW 0.6 cc's. It's a 0.6 cc farmer chamber made by PTW. Okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Okay, good. Well, we will see everyone Sunday for our next session. Mm -hmm. Also with Dr. Escoli. Great, look forward to it.